So let's go into a little bit of the specifics, right, by indication. So we have anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. We have uh, substance abuse. There's a lot of different indications and a lot of different types of medications that can treat those, right? So I would love for each of you to go into a little bit of, you know, what is your company studying? What is the indication? How does it work? Why do you think that there's promise for that specific category? So Evan, do you want to start? Sure. So side by Therapeutics, our value proposition is that we grow these uh, psychedelic drugs with bacteria, genetically modified bacteria. So it's a production method, but we're a drug development company and discovery company. Uh, our initial clinical trials are going to be with biosynthetic psilocybin. And I, I should note that nobody, we are an investment conference, talk about the opportunity. Nobody actually can own psilocybin. It, it exists in a mushroom for you know thousands of years. There's no real intellectual property on that molecule. What we have done, we have an enormous patent portfolio. We filed 16 patents on the production method of using genetically modified bacteria. And this was a research first, uh, using a recombinant host to very efficiently convert into some of these um, alkaloids. Uh, we, make, we just make it far more efficiently. It's, uh, it's faster and it's far less expensive than using any other production method for psilocybin and some of the other molecules we synthesized. So that's our value, that we can make it a lot less expensively and a lot faster. But we've been building up this portfolio. We have 100 molecules in the portfolio, and we have molecules with different characteristics. Um, at SciBio, we have three different laboratories. We have an academic laboratory for discovery and optimization. We have an industrial laboratory that we're converting to CG XP over the next year, and we have our own dedicated vivarium where we do animal studies on a daily basis on multiple tryptamines and phenthylamines. And we look at the interactions as well between these, and we found some very interesting combinations. And we've also discovered some molecules that are acting equivalent to um, Prozac and psilocybin in, in, in rodent models for anti-anxiolytic and antidepressive activity. So all that being said, we're working, initially working in depression. That's with these animals. We are going to be filing an IND shortly on a, a subcategory in depression. We haven't publicly disclosed that, but we had our first pre-IND meeting with the FDA, and they gave us the, uh, the affirmation on 10 different indications in that area. Great. Saad, so, you, you have a fund that's exclusively focused on mental health. How do you determine which companies um, that you, you know, invest in and what is the criteria that you use? Yeah, you know, we started in February of 2020. Um, we looked at looked at over 400 opportunities. We've invested in 28 companies, SciBio being one, Bexin being one. <laughs> um, so for us, we're trying to solve the problem for mental health. We're agnostic in terms of the protocol taken. What we want to know is um, what are the what's the indication you're going after? What's the unmet need? What's the IP that there is there? What's the efficacy? What's the team? What's the background of the team? Um, it's all well and done. You've got great scientists, but do you also have the ability to raise capital? Do you have the ability to you know, access deep pockets of, 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 of funding, both from public markets and private markets and so on? So um, it, 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 you have to sift through a lot, mm -hmm. right? Um, but um, our, in our first fund, which is closed, it closed last year, you know, just to tell you about the, the the way the markets have behaved. The first fund has generated close to 400% return. Um, the second fund is what we're on now. Um, and um, the exciting part is what we're learning in terms of these new chemical entities that are coming up, right? Yeah. Where we're learning from the first generation and we're taking the approach that, the, you know, the, for example, what SciBio is doing, um, melding it with, with other aspects of being able to target receptors without touching other receptors. See, that's the biggest issue, really, that the SSRIs have. They do work in the sense that they target the receptor they're supposed to, but then they got to meet every other receptor. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? And we don't want them to do that. We just want them to target a particular receptor so that you don't have the side effects. And um, that's where this is going now. It's mm -hmm. becoming more customized. That's what's exciting us, um, and I think it's pretty profound. So there's a lot of research out there. We've talked about this a little bit. There's a lot of research out there, but how do you determine which research is going to uh, result in a commercial viable market and uh, a true biotech company, right? So that's, that's yeah, what I'd like the, people the, to understand. The, there's, this is very complex, right? It's not just about getting a drug through the FDA because a lot of these will get through FDA. Mm -hmm. The problem is how do you commercialize? What's the delivery mechanism? Right? What's the protocol which we're going to be administered? Um, who's doing the training? What kind of training protocols are there? It's very complex. You have to look at all those facets 
to be able to see which are the companies that are really have the mechanism to be able to succeed in that protocol, um, and do they have all of that lined up? And we get surprised when we look at companies that not only do they have not paid attention to the IP, but their IP intellectual property is very loose, but also that they have given absolutely no thought to commercialization whatsoever, yeah. right? And, and th that's one of the biggest things. We've seen publicly traded companies that have done very well in the public space, and they get their drug through the FDA, and then they weren't able to commercialize, and that stock came tumbling down. And they, you know, yeah. That's a mistake you can't make. In right. Industry. And Jeff, can you talk about your company as it relates to substance abuse? Why is that a big market? Why, why did you choose that particular category? And what are you guys doing that's different from what's out there in the current market? Uh, I will defer to you about the training, because I mean, you, you, MAPS has done an, an enormous amount of heavy lifting on that front, a very, very important aspect. But um, our, we're starting with pain, actually, uh, with ketamine. And we're using that as kind of the flagship to bring our, our device and delivery solution and formulation together. And then we will branch ketamine into other categories. We, of course, as I said, have the psychedelics as well. Uh, those are a little bit behind where we are with ketamine in terms of our, our development program. But I would point out that there's actually, uh, to, to some extent, kind of drafting on what you were bringing up, Andrew, that it's, the psychedelics have effects on the body, mind, and the spirit. And actually, the, at, the, at the body level, it's actually so specific that it's kind of interesting and, and a little bit hard to understand. But they have anti-inflammatory effects, and they have, a, they have a capacity to recruit neurons that have gone quiet, let's say, after a head injury or closed you know, helmet injury in, in warfare or post-stroke. Uh, there are a lot of neurons that will often become quiet. They'll go quiet even though they're not dead. They just need to be recruited and kind of brought back into the fold. It's like, hey, come on back in. We need you. Um, how can you get that to happen? Well, remember what I was talking about. To increase the ability of neurons to talk to each other and to escape from the inhibitory tone that happens. We know that these kinds of patterns get even more specifically set in after head injuries. So we have a lot of different applications that are actually worth looking at. You don't have to always go big. Uh, actually, small doses, the kind of microdosing model, and there are also certain models that are coming down the pike, which are probably lower doses of more friendly psychedelics, kind of gentler psychedelics, lower doses and shorter time windows, uh, so that you don't have to get so much done in a single session. Uh, this might be a kind of winning model for people that uh, are anxious, want to try these out, but are not kind of ready to go all in. It's kind of like getting into the shallow end of the pool a bit. But I think that those models will actually be coming along and, and will be attractive. Mm -hmm. Anna, do you want to talk about what's happening with MAPS now and what's coming sure, on the horizon? Yeah. I mean, I'd love to also talk about the treatment protocol that hasn't been brought up yet. So we're not talking about a, a psychedelic where you would get prescribed and take it at home. We're talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy protocol. So these are with therapists who have been highly trained in the modality. The modality that we train is one um, where we really see the, the, the therapist role as facilitator of an inner directed experience with the same idea that somebody mentioned, you know, if you get an arm injury or, you know, you have a cut, your body knows how to heal itself. It's the same idea. The, the mind really knows how to heal itself. And it's about putting the therapist there to support and facilitate a person's access to their own inner healing intelligence. And one of the most interesting bits about our data is that we found after our phase two that the, um, so we have about 68% of people um, at the end of the research no longer meeting the criteria for a PTSD diagnosis. These are people who have suffered with PTSD on average for 14 years. There's no known cure for PTSD. PTSD is a condition that people tend to live with and manage symptoms throughout their lives. A lot of these SSRIs are symptom management. They're palliative. They help kind of, they're like band-aids that help people cope and, and deal with what they're experiencing, but don't actually go to the root of what is causing their issues in their lives. Um, and we found, so we found after um, the, we do our three month follow up, we get that number and then we completely stop working with the participant, but we found at the one year follow up that that number jumped by 10%. So people continued to improve without any intervention from the therapist or any communication from the therapists um, by 10% more 
one year after their treatment. And the treatment protocol that we're working with, our FDA design, is a three-month protocol with three dosing sessions of MDMA, which are six to eight-hour sessions in a room with two therapists. And interspersed between those three sessions are uh, 12, 90-minute preparation and integration sessions. So you're looking at um, a 15-session period over three and a half months. And that is what we're getting, these incredibly high results. And we also have found that 83% of people had clinically significant reduction in their PTSD symptoms. So there's just nothing else in the market that comes close to the results that we're seeing, which is part of why we're seeing all of this excitement, because these things are, you know, these are real issues that people live with sometimes for their entire lives, and we're providing in so many people real relief that's lasting and durable. Um, in addition to our PTSD research, we're also looking at eating disorders, which is another condition that is incredibly difficult to treat. Um, we've done research uh, in our history looking at end-of-life anxiety. Some of our partners are looking at um, smoking cessation, alcohol cessation. We've seen that also with psilocybin. You mentioned brain, brain injury, traumatic brain injury. I spoke with a stroke patient last week who had their cognitive impairment come back online after using psilocybin. Um, ibogaine is another really interesting molecule for traumatic brain injuries. There's a group of veterans, special forces veterans, that have been uh, working with ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT. There's, there's a report observational study of over 200 special forces veterans, and the results are just astounding um, with the impairments coming back online, their cognitive function. So there's a lot of different ways and lenses that you can look at this through, but I just want to be clear that we're talking about not psychedelics in an isolated way. With the, There's this like theory in psychiatry that it's just neurochemistry that's happening, and that's that's. but we're looking at the whole therapeutic approach and giving people these deep dive sessions, um, these expanded sessions. Most therapy sessions are a 50 minute hour, right? So a lot of work can get done in these in this short window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good call. And I think can what I you're touching a, just on. Just a really quick point yeah. on this, which is which is that it's, it's also really important to understand that, that what Leona was saying is that the the life-saving aspect, the kind of coming back to life of the human being that we're talking about here, you can imagine what that means to the social fabric with, with, that they're woven into. Think about what it means to their wife or their children or their parents or you know, their community in terms of them being an active participant. Because a lot of the problems with, with depression, extreme depression, PTSD, is that, the, that uh, people kind of feel like they're walking dead in a way. Like they're not really present in their lives and they're not present with the people that are around them. Um, so the healing really uh, has, has a, a quite a ripple effect actually for society in general. Yeah, it's a yeah, global it's epidemic, right? Most yeah. depressed country in the world, China, according to World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Second most depressed country in the world, India. Third most depressed country in the world is the US. But the US leads with substance abuse. Mm -hmm. This is a global epidemic. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like to add on to what uh, Liana said. Uh, you mentioned some of these other drugs. So we're t here talking about psychedelics. Um, there are a uh, large number of psychoactive compounds, and they are all very different. I mean, we had an excellent conversation last night about some of these are far more docile than others, and what Liana just mentioned of uh, 5-MeO-DMT and Ibogaine are far more in intense and take much longer. Well, 5-MeO-DMT lasts, you know, 15 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, but you think you could feel like you're gone for thousands of years, it's been described to me, and Ibogaine, I believe, is about a 48-hour experience, very, very intense. You need to surrender to these. So they're all very, very different, which makes our industry really exciting and enormous growth potential.